G'day. A couple of videos ago I did something on making up uh, dividing plates such as, as these ones uh, and they're all done now. I realised after making that video that I actually hadn't done anything on setting up a, uh, a dividing head or, or, a, or a rotary table with dividing plates to demonstrate how it's done and, and show a few of the things that I've learnt over the years about using them. So this video is a, a mixture of bits and pieces. Firstly, uh, setting up the, the head um, or the rotary table. I used a rotary table because that's what I had on the mill at the time and the, the dividing plates are bigger, uh, but the same thing applies. Um, so setting, setting that up, putting the plates in place, working out where your sectors go, and then a few tips for the for the operation so that you get repeatability out of it. Uh, as I said, this is the same for rotary tables and dividing heads. The only difference is really that uh, they like to have different ratios in them. So my rotary table has got a uh, 90 to 1 ratio in it. My dividing head's 40 to 1. There are other, are other dividing heads out there which have got different ratios in them. So you, first thing you need to do is check and as I've done, make sure you've got the table on hand that suits the device. So some people ask, what should I get, a rotary table or a dividing head? And uh, my answer is probably that the rotary table is the more versatile piece of equipment, particularly if it can be used vertically, so it, it mimics a, uh, uh, a dividing head. The only thing I would say about a rotary table is that they get much heavier as they get bigger. And so my rule of thumb for, for rotary table size is that you don't want one wider than the width of your table. So if you've got a nine inch table, which is 225 millimeters, you probably don't want much more than an eight inch dividing head, which is 200 millimeters. Uh, if your table is narrower than a six inch dividing head, 150 millimeters is probably the go. Uh, the upside to going bigger is that the, the bigger they are, the more leverage you get when you use them for um, milling circular patterns. So. Uh, don't don't think that oh well I'm only going to be using it for for small stuff I'll get a four inch one when you can fit a six inch it's better to get for the the six inch first step is to work out how many holes you want so uh, the one I'm doing next is 41 holes so I need the a wheel with the 41 disc there's the a wheel and there's the 41 ring uh, it's convention to install the numbers sort of vertically like that just so you can read them you don't have to but it certainly makes it easier when you're trying to um, use these things. Next on the stack are the dividing fingers or the sector, whatever you want to call it. That just pops on there. And then there's a spring clip that goes on there just to hold that down. And then last of all, there's a handle of some sort and these attach in a variety of ways. So there's my indexing mechanism set up, um, fingers, handle, and this will be the same on a dividing head or a rotary table as I've got this set up to do. Um, most people do a rotary table for milling curves and things and a dividing head for dividing, but this was just more convenient for me. When I'm indexing, particularly if I have to do multiple um, turns, so in this particular case I have to do two turns plus eight holes. So I've set my sectors for eight holes, but the indexing thing, first of all I move the sector, so I've got that hard up against that stop, then one turn, two turns, and let that pop in. Okay, and now that that's now indexed I can put the lock back on. But I find that instead of going, <laughs> I'm better off if I go one, two, and then the bit. Just just being deliberate so that you don't actually go an extra turn because once again that will put your holes up there off. To get the correct divisions I need to move eight on here so I need to adjust my fingers to suit. Now one thing that sometimes people forget is that it's actually about the spaces you count so I need eight so there's my 41 again, 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's where I need my sec sectors set. I did have trouble with these sectors that this, this section here was actually about the same height as this section so I've milled a little bit out because that needs to clamp firmly. If you want to have any confidence in what you're doing then make sure these things clamp up properly. And because I'm a bit paranoid about this sort of stuff I'll actually check this again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the simple reason is once you have, you've set this and you start indexing, um, if this is wrong you've just produced scrap. So you might as well check it a couple of times and make sure you're, you're happy with the result. So there it is sitting in the, in the 41 ring and that index is round to give me eight. Two things to note here. Firstly, this particular uh, set of holes requires one turn plus 47, sorry, one turn plus 43, 40 sevenths. Rather difficult to just keep that all in your head, especially when you've got all these holes. So one of the things that, that I do is counting my spaces, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, put a chalk mark. So that way I've got 10, 20, 30, 40 here. And then counting another three spaces, one, two, three gets me to there. So that's that's the hole I'm I'm going to, that's the hole I'm coming from. However, these sectors don't actually reach that far. Right, that's about as much as they'll do. Now one thing I should probably do is put a bevel on the other side of these so I can use them more easily, but in cases like that what I'll then do is I'll position my my sector fingers like that and I'll go from the outside to the outside. Now what that means is you've got to get your head around the idea that you know, you're know you here, you have one and then 43. Typically what I'll do when I'm indexing something like this on a, on a rotary table in the horizontal plane is I'll center my y-axis and then all I'll do is move my x along to get my various uh, circles and I've, I've already moved this index this along. Um, this is all about routine. Okay so when I'm doing this sort of indexing uh, I'll drill till I get down to depth, wind it back up, unlock the, the table, move my sectors, go around the, the appropriate amount um, whether it's just a little bit or whether it's a turn in something or other. Relock my table, engage my feed, give it a squirt of, of coolant and repeat. And I can tell you I've indexed occasionally on when I've had uh, been cutting gears and I've indexed out a sequence and I've managed to wipe out a tooth. So it's for your own good to get into a bit of a routine um, that is repeatable and so you can sort of that right this then this then this then this and this and repeat. A couple of particular things about this job. One is that when doing this sort of stuff you want to use the, sh the shortest drill bit you can find. Uh, this is a, a, a stub drill uh, and that's simply because that means the drill bit doesn't flex as much. It means you don't have to worry so much about the, the, the position of the hole being right. I've actually strapped this down to a, a lump of aluminium or rather I've, I've bolted this onto a um, piece of aluminium and then I've bolted that down to my rotary table. That means that I can come along, once I've got my, my table centred, I can come along and set out my um, attachment screw um, holes, drill those into the block, tap them and then I can index across and do all my, my uh, um, dividing circles and know they're concentric. If I was doing this repetitively I'd probably make up a little um, spigot that I could center, actually center the spigot on the table just to stuff, stuff a lot of mucking around and maybe with some uh, hold down flanges so that I don't have to have the clamp sticking up because when I get to the outer circle sometimes I've, I've found I've, I need to move the, uh, the clamps out the way. This is the uh, what you call the moment of truth I guess. Um, 
one, two, and a bit. And that's how I tell that I've got my holes equally spaced. I've, I've indexed back down to the, the, the start hole and uh, that looks like it's pretty much lined up. So I'm happy with that. If I'd found out that I'd, I, was, I was missing a little bit, then disaster because I'd have to remake the whole plate probably. If when doing your indexing you lose count or you're not quite sure, you bump the sector or whatever, uh, it's not the end of the world because what you can do if you're indexing away and you said now was that one or two you can go back to your original position and just check the alignment of the, of the hole. You notice I put my finger on the end of the sector and that's on purpose and that's just basically to hold it there because if you didn't have it there you could knock that and then you would lose your position but if you have your finger on the sector you've got a much better chance of keeping the right spot Always try and index the same way, get rid of any backlash. Um, rotary tables aren't too bad because the, the, the worm can be adjusted into the, the screw, but it's a good habit to get into anyway. Uh, so yes, keep your, keep your finger on the end of the, of the sector there, and that way, fingers crossed, you know, if you do lose count, you can go back and, and, and sort yourself out. One important part of this setup is actually this thing. It's a wooden mat, uh, duck boarding, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and you can do the same thing with rubber. But I find that, um, particularly when standing by the mill like this, having something springy like this to stand on and moving around a little bit certainly makes it a little bit easier to take. Hopefully this is of use to people and uh, can show you uh, how to use these things. Uh, once again, because of CNC, uh, this sort of manual equipment isn't used all that often, but it is handy to, uh, to have it, particularly in a home shop where you don't necessarily have CNC.